So welcome to this talk about major technology trends and how they impact application integration. Probably give you a sense of where I think the future of integration is going and maybe give you hopefully some advice on how to get ready for it. My name is Richard Siroder. I'm a director of cloud product management for CenturyLink, a trainer for Pluralsight, a Microsoft MVP, lead editor for cloud at infoq.com and occasionally write and tweet and things like that. So I talked to few of my smart friends to ask them what the current state of integration was, and I'll go through the survey results in just a moment. But it's, uh, to summary, this was the assessment of what we're all doing today with integration. We're linking business systems by sending thousands of XML messages, using an internal or an on-premises message bus, and usually integrating with about five or so web service type endpoints. Obviously, there's different things. But this represented the, the general summary of what an integration project looked like today. Does that seem crazy to anybody, or does that seem pretty reasonable? If I put something crazy there, would you have said no? I don't know. It's, it's early. So what I don't want you to have happen is get caught by surprise by things that are changing. Right? There's a lot of things going on, and I think most of us like to be ready for it before our CIO goes and buys a technology and tells us to put it in or starts an initiative. So how can we understand a few of these trends so that we're not surprised when the time comes to start implementing them? So my goal is to help prepare you. My job is to keep up to date and I can't keep up to date. So at least the best I can do is, with all of us in attending things like today, is keeping up with those trends, the things that matter, the things that will change your job over the next few years. So how are we gonna get there? I'm gonna do three things today. I'm gonna first talk about the current state of integration a little bit more. Then I'll talk through 12 major industry trends and how they apply to application integration. And then finally, not to just leave you hanging, we'll talk about how can you make sure you're ready for them and so you're not surprised when the time comes. So let's talk about integration today. I pulled a few dozen of my smartest integration friends, or at least they told me they were my smartest integration friends. I'm hoping that they were right. To find out what does integration look like today? What have they been doing for the last two years and so about 32 people answered me, which was nice of them. They represented about 430 projects over the last two years. So it's a decent sample size. It's not scientific. I don't claim to do great surveys. But I wanted to get a sense of what are people doing and give you a sense of what the standard integration is today. So first question I asked is, what is your hourly message volume on a typical project? About 56% said thousands. Not surprising. Millions, as you can tell is really small. People are not doing massive scale yet through a message bus engine. Most are doing thousands or hundreds, the second most amount. A few doing dozens in that case. But that's probably not too surprising, but this is kind of the state of most projects today. Then I asked, how many things are you integrating with? How many endpoints do you have? And this was kind of all over the board. My highest number was 300. My lowest number was, of course, one, because zero makes no sense. So it was a wide range. The average was about 24, but the mean, if you just line them up, was five. So about five was the midpoint of what people are doing. But you can see there's some small ones, there's some large ones. There's not uniformity here. If I were back here in a few years, I would think you're going to keep seeing more things move to the right where you have more and more endpoints you're integrating with. Then I asked, what technology are you using today on your projects? And then more importantly for me, how often are you using it? Because you might have used it once, but I would think the trend can help us see how often do you use it at least half the time? How often is that? So, not shockingly, especially given I was interviewing a lot of BizTalk related people, 94% of them are using a BizTalk or an on-premises sort of messaging engine. It's not shocking or else I don't think I'd be here speaking. It would be a weird presentation if this wasn't the focus. 64% said they had actually touched a cloud integration box. It's a high number. I actually didn't expect that. So it was a little, little informative. You people love SOAP web services. We can't wean you off this. You love it. We can't fight it 100% have used it at some point in the last two years. REST is making a move though, 85% have used it at some point, so it's definitely something more emerging. People doing ETL tools, things like SQL Server integration services, that was about 81% at some point. <coughs> and then 38% of you are using some sort of stream processing engine to pre-process data. So again, not, I don't think too shocking. What I was interested in was the next column. So 83% of those 94% are using an on-premises integration bus all the time. I mean, at least half the time. This one was almost 75% or more. Only 6% are actually using a cloud integration bus half the time. That, that's more like it, right? I think it would have been, you wouldn't have trusted me if I had made this number like 100%. You would have thought I'm pulling really weird people. 
So I think that's realistic right now, that you're not doing a lot, you're touching it, but you're not using it all the time. 84% using soap, you use it, you love it all the time. Rest though, it's not there yet. I don't even, not even half the time do half the people use a REST-based web service. ETL tool, not all the time. And stream processing, not even half of those people are using that all the time. So a decent state of integration today in terms of what tools are people using. What are you integrating with? Not too shockingly, it's business applications, both custom and commercial, pretty evenly. That's the exact number for both. So that's not too surprising. Relational databases right there. You guys are not touching NoSQL databases right now. You're not really touching devices. This stuff is not reaching integration mainstream. Again, not too shocking, but I would again expect these numbers to be different three or four years from now. And you love XML, don't you? 75, about 78% are doing XML all the time. Some of those poor SAPs are still using text files and ASCII files and CSVs, I'm sorry about that. And then a few people are still, are actually moving to JSON and moving a more modern, at least web-friendly file format. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense. So I'm gonna walk through some industry trends now. I tried to find the ones that were most relevant to you. I couldn't, in a good conscience, bring in like drones or 3D printing. I mean, that would really be tough for me to stretch how that applies to application integration. So these are ones that are specific that are gonna impact you in some way over these next few years. So I work for a cloud company. Of course, I should start with cloud anyway. Is it something we all hear people hype and talk about all the time? A second title for this presentation could have been, here are the most overhyped technologies you've heard about for the last year. This seems like a more positive approach, but each one of these is something you hear a lot about. Maybe you've even started to ignore it because it's just so much hype. But 87% of companies are doing something with cloud, according to a right scale survey from earlier this year. I don't think that's surprising. You're using some software as a service application. You might not be doing a full blown infrastructure as a service, but you might be using some hosted sort of application there. So what is cloud? My uh, CTO likes to break it down with three characteristics mainly. It's self-service. If you have to open a ticket to buy the service, you are not using a cloud platform completely has to be self-service on demand. It has to be automated. If you click a button on a web page and 14 little Oompa Loompas run around and turn stuff on, that is not a cloud platform, right? It's gotta be automated. It's gotta be programmable. If it doesn't have an API, it's not a cloud platform. At least some, most people start to believe that. I think it makes sense. You have to be able to consume it with your own applications, integrate with it, tie it to mobile devices. So it has to be programmable. You're getting, I think, familiar with those layers of abstraction. Is it software as a service where you're actually just renting software? Platform as a service where you're running it from the web application tier up? Or infrastructure as a service where you own the operating system and up? And it's always a mix of all. Very few people are using just one, right? You're using dynamic CRM online for your CRM sort of application, and then you're running your custom applications in an infrastructure tier. That's fine, you're supposed to mix and match. And then there's hosting options. Clearly public cloud is something like most of us believe is the future, but there's also private cloud for people who aren't ready to put everything in a public cloud. And then there's hybrid cloud, which is probably the new normal for the next five years, which is you have a mix of both and it's your job to integrate them. Network integration, identity integration, application integration, all those are gonna come into play. And then finally, you're seeing a lot of companies, you can only cut prices so much. I mean, at this point, I'm charging you a penny and a half for a CPU. If I cut prices anymore, I'm gonna pay you to use our cloud. That's probably not a good business model. So you've gotta typically add services on top, managed services, application services. So you're seeing a bigger trend in that space. So what does cloud mean for all of us doing application integration? First, latency is a little more of a concern, right? Those applications that worked really well in your data center between <laughs> a couple of cages sitting a half a foot apart where there's two milliseconds of latency, all of a sudden, if I'm jumping in ocean, that's 200 milliseconds. Or even in country, I can have more. So those chatty applications that might be integrating together, synchronous calls, all of a sudden that gets to be a pretty lousy performance when those components start moving all over the place. I've got data security. Us Americans aren't very good at that, so I'm sorry. We give data to anyone who asks for it. That's not something I have much say in. But that is something to be concerned about, right, realistically is that you have to take more ownership of encrypting data, not trusting your provider. You shouldn't trust your provider. You should be taking a very active security role, even in your integration. Don't trust that all of the integration points go over SSL. 
You can't guarantee that. You should be securing the payload itself. There's going to be new endpoints. Gartner predicts that by 2017, two-thirds of all your integrations will be outside of your corporate firewall. You are going to have new cloud-based endpoints pretty rapidly coming up. You've got to be ready for those. Troubleshooting is already not super easy with distributed systems where your app actual flow is skipping between different applications and endpoints and locations. It even gets harder sometimes in cloud where you can't ask your cloud provider for a dump of their debug logs or look at their event log. You don't have that access. So you've got to now figure out how can you instrument your application so when it leaves your integration bus and goes somewhere else, you can still somewhat troubleshoot a problem. And then REST orientation. SOAP is dying a slow death. It's going to take a little while, and it still will be around for quite a while, but any modern web development is typically happening with a REST-based web service model. And so as you deal with more software as a service applications, some of them don't even offer SOAP. So you're going to have to get more comfortable using REST-based endpoints, which luckily BizTalk and other products support. Internet of Things, as we move along the trail of hyped things, this is the top of the hype curve right now from Gartner, but 26 billion things are predicted to be in place by 2020. So if we talk about what, what's a thing, really an object connected to the internet, right? There's billions of sensors today, RFID tags and other things that are passive information, but these are internet connected things that can share their state of the world with something and also get information back. That's often that bi-directional communication, right? The thing might be telling you you're out of milk in your fridge and then you're able to do something and trigger orders and things like that, but data can go both ways. Those things are pretty amazing. You can have you know, smart sprinklers, smart garbage cans, smart egg cartons, my previous picture. And so some of those might seem frivolous, but even it can be smart meters. It can be other smart enterprise-oriented things. The whole point, though, you're not just doing this because you want a lot of little robots running around on the internet. It's because there's new insight, right? I can learn, if I'm a physician, that someone might be having a heart attack because they're actually using a connected thing that's measuring how they're doing. I can learn more about the state of the world by having things telling me about it versus a person keying things in. So the whole point is I'm learning more so my company can do more agile things. So why do we care about Internet of Things as integration developers? It's different communication in this model. So MQTT is a more dominant protocol for doing very, very lightweight communication. You need small payloads. These things don't have a lot of memory. They don't have a lot of storage. So I can't be sending four meg XML files back and forth. Might not make any sense. So I have to think of new ways potentially to share very bite-sized information over sketchy, sometimes not available channels. A lot more data though. When you have a thing sending you a reading every 10 seconds, can you imagine in your service bus today, if I came to you and said, what would happen if I multiplied your traffic by 10? How would your environment do? After you woke up from passing out, you would probably say, I don't think we would do very well with that. Because sometimes you architect differently for thousands of messages versus millions. And so you've got to think about what are those patterns that work for one and not the other. So many more endpoints. I don't care if you're using BizTalk 360 or something else. If you have 10,000 endpoints, you are not a happy camper, not alone a million. So as you start having more and more things you're talking to, the way you managed your endpoints before might not be a proper solution. So that's where you get into pre-filtering content. Do you need things at the edge of your network that takes in data from things and mobile devices and other things we'll talk about and pairs it down, right? Filters out the noise or aggregates it so that what comes into your message bus is an hourly reading, even though the data is coming in every 10 seconds. You aggregate it and drop an hourly message in there. Different ways to think about it so you can pre-filter and screen the content. And then finally, immature security. HP predicted that or it says about 70% of things are insecure because they have no encryption, they don't require passwords, they store a lot of personally identifiable information. I think last week there was some word that the Nest thermostat could be hacked pretty easily. So this is a space where people are pushing out a lot of things and worrying about security later. A little bit dicey. So on an integration side, you can't be trusting your input, right? You don't take it for granted that this is coming in as good data. Mobility. This one's probably a little further along than most of the rest of them, but we're talking a big increase in the number of business and productivity apps that are being used by people. So it's not just us playing games on our phone, it's actually doing legitimate work in a mobile setting and probably connecting to back-end systems a lot more frequently now. So this is mobile devices. Everyone here probably has, if not a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, 
sitting at a desk with a traditional desktop is not what most of us are doing anymore. You have mobile devices, you're accessing them on different screens and on the go. And the workforce. I work from home three weeks a month. Other people work in a coffee shop. People are on the go, you're working at home. Who's answered their email after 10 o'clock last night? Yes, some of you do. Don't be ashamed of yourself. We're always now connected, right? You're filling out your timesheet Friday at 11.50 p.m. because you realize you forgot. You're always accessing some of your line of business systems at all times. And that's that activity, right? I'm sure you're hearing more and more from other groups within your business units. I want access to my financial systems, my business system, whatever. I want that on the go. And I don't want to use your weird, clumsy VPN technology either. I want easy ways to integrate my data. So we're going to see more and more of that. I've done this talk the last two days in some other countries. And they were saying more and more, we had two applications last year. Now we have 50. And these are all touching our back end systems. You're just going to keep seeing more of that, where people <coughs> want to tap into those systems and don't want to be on the office network to use them. So what's that mean to us? Your applications aren't 9 to 5 anymore. You know, 15 years ago, people were probably not banging on your business systems 24 hours a day. Now they can if they want to, right? I can access it at home. I can access it in a different time zone. I'm, because I'm mobile, there's no good time to say, I'll take the system down for an hour for some maintenance. It's hard to do maintenance now. You have to be thinking about how do I do in-flight updates and not have to take my systems offline because someone may always be using it now. It's the unpredictable usage. How in the world do you scale your environments now? Do you buy giant machines and just figure they're going to sit quietly all the time but spike one day a month? Have you figured out a way to be elastic with it? But unpredictable usage, especially with mobile devices, where all of a sudden your ordering system gets flooded because of a social mention and everyone's using your mobile app to order something and just pummeling your message bus. Are you ready for that? Can you handle that kind of usage? Internet connectivity is still not ubiquitous. Right? I can tell when my boss gets off an airplane because I get 40 emails at one time because they all queued up in his inbox. And that happens with our mobile apps too. Sometimes they've got little queuing technology in them. So when they get back on the connection, they can send all that information back in. So you're going to have spikes. That internet connectivity is not always there. Lightweight data transfer again. I'm sure we all love when we're on our phone and it takes 30 seconds to load the web page. I don't. And then, so you've got to be more thoughtful with what data are you passing between mobile devices? You can't do things the way you did before and assume that there's lots of memory and processing power and bandwidth. Wearables. Apple launched their watch. We don't know what it costs. We don't know how much battery it has, but you're all going to still buy one probably because it's made by Apple. So good for them, right? They're really helping bring wearables into the space. Prediction is will be 200 million wearables bought per year by the year 2020. And so what is this? This is body-borne computers. This is you wearing your Fitbit. This is Stevion <laughs> telling me every day how much he ran thanks to his Nike app. It's, it's things telling me that I'm wearing that are giving me a sense of my heart rate. They're telling me what's going on. It's Google Glass for people who have no self-awareness and don't mind looking silly. You can do those things. That's great. And so that's out there, right? People are using these things. They're buying those things when they have a lot of extra money. It factors in your surroundings, right? What's my temperature? What's going on with my heart rate, what's going on with other things. It factors in what's happening and generating a lot of data. You can have really sophisticated things like a Fitbit that doesn't even have a screen. I can obviously have an Apple Watch and Samsung or other devices that have screens and their computers and they can do amazing things. Just like who had a calculator watch 20 years ago. Come on, those were awesome. You also could have had a Swatch watch. So I mean, it was a very same sort of model, right? Very sophisticated, very complex. We have to expect both. But it's a different model that's always on. Wearables don't really, they have a different interaction model, right? I don't have to turn things on and off. It's constantly sensing things and doing things. And in our place, generating data. But the enterprise scenarios here are cool. This isn't just people goofing around with Google Glass or watches. It's people are doing real enterprise scenarios now, such as with Google Glass, being able to speak and create a trouble ticket when someone's in the field and doing some things. Or I'm able to use a watch potentially to enter in my timesheet when I'm working and quickly key that I just started work and I just stopped work. So even Salesforce.com just launched a wearables SDK over the summer. So you can build applications that actually connect to these devices and load your information. In. So you're going to see more and more companies introducing SDKs and tools to make it possible for these body-born computers to generate data. Still got to be lightweight, though. Many of these things are bandwidth constrained, memory constrained, so you have to think about that. As you can imagine, all this data volume, 
If I'm wearing something so that my doctor can check my health at my next visit, and it's generating information about my health every 10 seconds, every second, that's a lot of information I didn't have before. So you've got to think, how again, how am I handling this flood of information coming in? So like before, it's going to come down to data aggregation. You really are going to have to think about tools that can take in data, aggregate it, filter it, help me make sense of it, so I'm not just getting flooded with raw information. Big data. Continue about exciting things that you're probably sick about hearing about. But 64% of companies aren't sick of it. They're either doing or starting or working on big data projects, even if they don't know what it means, because that's how we do big trends. But what is it? It's three Vs. It's been around since 2001. It's gotten more nuanced, but it's velocity, variety, and volume. We all think about volume, right? Big data must mean it's petabytes of logs that Facebook generates every day, or it's all the molecular modeling data that I, I load out of my system if I'm a healthcare company. But it's not just volume. It can be variety. A whole complex set of logs that I want to analyze together and it doesn't work with my traditional tools, or vol uh, velocity. This data is coming in quickly and I don't want to know about it a month later. Knowing my patient died of a heart attack because I read the report a month later is no good. Right? I want to know now because I'm processing this data live. So the velocity is are the systems ready to handle that speed. But the definition Gartner keeps refining it is really it's those things but when the traditional tools can't handle it. Can those tools handle terabytes and petabytes of log information or just raw data? Can they visualize it? Can they handle the speed? And typically, no. So you're looking at additional tools and technologies that can handle lots of information, processing it quickly, diverse sort of data. And you have to think about management. How do I curate, search, store, share all of this information I'm generating now? What am I doing with it? Am I using cloud-based storage because I'm running out of space? How do I secure it all? Good questions. But the whole point, as usual, is new insight. Right? I'm monitoring click streams on a website, not just for fun, but because I'm trying to figure out what pages are getting certain traffic and how to respond. So it's about getting new insight out of this. So what are some concerns? Well, if you have some slow integration processes, and they're fine if they're slow now, but now if you start flooding the system, it's going to really back up. You're going to have this giant queue of things waiting for an orchestration because your process is slow. That might be an issue, and all of a sudden people are expecting velocity of this big data. I'll almost guarantee you that your message bus is either going to be the source or the destination of a big data process, right? It might take message from a Hadoop run and then order something or contact somebody. Or it might be a feeder into that process because it gets some data, somebody else gets some data, and you smash it all together. So your message bus is going to be a big part of whatever your big data solution is. As before, I'll beat a dead horse, it's going to be about aggregation. It's going to be some way to make sense of information either up front or after the fact because that, you don't need to process a million messages through your message bus. Maybe you only need a few thousand, but you need something else making sense of it ahead of time. And new data architectures. No SQL databases, Hadoop processing. This is starting to become very mainstream stuff, and you're going to see more of it get brought into your organizations where you have to integrate with it. API-centric design. This is something where you know, if you've been doing SOA and things, you're familiar with the concept clearly of making APIs, but there's a new movement around actually carving this out in a developer-friendly way. There's 12,000 plus public APIs on the programmablewebcom directory, and that number just keeps climbing of available public APIs for you to mash up applications, share information, and so forth. But what is it? The API-centric design is about very easily consumable services. Not necessarily all the governance of things like service-oriented architectures, big governance policies and process, and it's about really developer-centric, external-facing services that sometimes you can even treat like a product or service. Wouldn't it be great if IT didn't just cost money, but they could generate money by exposing data functions as services that other people could use? People are doing that, where you're actually taking data sets and sharing it out with the public or some really interesting algorithms that you expose as an API. But the whole point is very developer-centric. It's typically REST-based, using JSON, launching up APIs that make it really easy to integrate apps, not just service-oriented architecture, which was more about organizational concerns. The API-centric design movement is about give me some functions to expose your applications and mash things up. So it's different than SOA. It's not the same level of rigor. It's not the same level of process. But this is where you're seeing a lot more developers spending time cranking through this. And we're going to 
have that impact us in integration. We're going to have more RESTful connections. Because developers today, if they have a choice, are not writing SOAP-based web services typically. At least that's not what the trends are showing. Fewer technology adapters, though. As there's more and more APIs exposed, and web APIs specifically, I don't want to use your obscure adapter that talks to some weird protocol that talks to your system. Right? I want web-based integration that I can easily tie together. Much, much fewer just straight up technology adapters. Less rigid schemas, you know, things like JavaScript and REST don't really have schemas too well defined yet. So BizTalk kind of made JSON have an XSD schema, which is very unnatural and makes me nervous. But it works. But there is not a standard for that sort of thing. And there's cool new technologies. Microsoft bought that API management suite a while back that's now available on Azure. You've got new service gateways from companies like SOA Software. There's more and more tools in this space now that act specifically as API directories or API translation engines. Microservices. Who's heard of microservices? A couple people. I could ask any question I would get a hand raise. It's fine. So on Google Trends, this has gone from zero to 100 in the last six months. Nobody was talking about this six months ago. Now this is an extremely hot topic in the industry, and you're not seeing many major technology conferences that doesn't have information about microservices. So what the heck is a microservice? Arguably, it's like a fine-grained SOA where I'm taking functionality and I'm really focusing it and not shipping big monolithic applications and services. I'm shipping individual capabilities that I can combine, and each one of those capabilities has its own life cycle. So there's an independent life cycle for each one of those that lets me do that. So I can imagine having an app where I'm not shipping the whole thing at once, but each one, like Netflix does this, I can update each service, and I don't have to really ask everybody else. I've got APIs that we all talk to each other on, but each microservice is maintained almost as a separate product. Microsoft is arguably doing this with their integration stack. What you'll see is there is no Microsoft integration cloud product, right? There is service bus relays, there's queues, there's notification hubs, event hubs, BizTalk services. These are all very different, almost microservices where each one does one thing really well, but they're not trying to do everything, right? They're not selling almost like a BizTalk product that's meant to do a lot of things. They're selling a lot of micro capabilities. The event hub guys and notification hub guys might be friendly. I don't think they talk to each other before they ship, right? They can just ship their thing, right? And I do blast notifications or I receive a lot of data. That's all I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. That sort of model is becoming more prevalent. Martin Fowler says that, and maybe this is controversial for this crowd, it's about smart endpoints and dumb pipes, right? I don't care about a big fancy ESB. I care about smart endpoints that know what they're doing. And if I need a little bit of queuing, I'll drop in RabbitMQ or Service Bus for Windows or something like that. That's at least one opinion that I don't need so much smarts in my middleware. I need smarter endpoints that can be versioned and maintained separately. So what's that mean for all of us? Potentially more endpoints. Right? If I'm having more of these focused services and not these monolithic operations, I might have more endpoints I have to deal with and manage in my, my BizTalk environment. They are coarse grained, though. The point is I'm not supposed to call these microservices a thousand times to get information. I'm going to ask for something, go do it, and give it back to me, and give me a, one payload. Don't make me really chatty with all these services. But again, the independent life cycle. For all of us, you might go from your application you integrate with changing three times a year to changing three times a month. And so what happens if individual endpoints keep changing all the time and there's no rhythm anymore? That's exciting, it's also terrifying. So you have to imagine what happens when this thing is constantly being updated. Are your processes ready in your integration tier to constantly be changing <coughs> things, testing things? Does orchestration matter, question mark? I think the answer is yes. I think you still need orchestration to tie together some of these services and long running processes to make sense of things, but Again, there's people in this space, if you talk to your developers who are doing microservices, they may say, I don't want to use your message bus anymore. And you might have to evangelize why it makes sense to still do it. Prepackaged integration. So this concept of, I used an IKEA picture here because I can't buy a table from IKEA and turn it into a birdhouse, right? There's certain pieces that fit together. It's prepackaged. It's meant to be whatever's in the box. I'm not just buying lumber and building something. It comes pre-made. And so you're seeing more of that in the integration space. There's 128 channels on if this, then that. Who uses IFTTT? You come across it. Really cool tool for regular people, regular people, to integrate their different social apps or business apps. Really simple stuff. Maybe 
if the temperature goes above this, change my thermostat. Or if I like something in Feedly, drop it into Evernote for a note for later. It's about taking systems and per people, kind of just combining them with really little simple recipe sort of things that can be executed. So you can say, well, that's kind of silly, frivolous stuff, but it's simplifying what the concept of integration is. Microsoft, with their Azure Active Directory, ships 2,400 pre-built app connectors. That would, that would have been unheard of years ago, right? It was, you had to pay US dollars, $15,000 a CPU for the SAP adapter for BizTalk. Guess what, that's free now. Connection is commodity. You can't charge for connections anymore. That doesn't mean anything anymore. It's about free connectivity and prepackaged integration. So it's cheap, pre-built connectors. You need more adapters in the box. MuleSoft has 99 of them. BizTalk has to get on their horse and start shipping more of them <coughs> themselves. Because it's about making it simpler and simpler to connect these endpoints. Composing it, right? It's not going to be drag and drop integration. I know Tor thinks that's possible, but it's hard to do drag and drop integration. As you have more and more adapters, though, some of those things will become easier. Most of these are public endpoints, though. As you can imagine, you're probably not going to find a pre built connector for your obscure finance system built in 1984. So it's more for software as a service sort of applications and things like that. A lot of these have, are pretty smart. Some orchestration built in, they know how to handle multiple operations at once. And so you're, again, you're seeing more of this in the space. So what's that mean for all of us? It means new expectations. Whether you like it or not, because integration's a little bit easier for the average person, somebody's gonna come to you and say, I want you to integrate A and B, and you're gonna say six months, and they're gonna say, that's crazy, that looks really easy. And maybe they already do that because everyone thinks integration is easy. We all know it's not. But the expectations, you still have to manage that. And people are seeing it simpler and simpler to integrate cloud-based systems. How come you're telling me it takes nine months? And so you're gonna have to work on that and be ready for that. Trying to do less customization because these things change a lot, because it is pre-packaged, I don't have options to customize. I have to work with what's in the box. More bundled adapters though. You're gonna see this from major providers, you're gonna see this from cloud platforms, you're gonna see this from messaging engines. You have to give me more and more simple ways to connect to business systems. And you're gonna see more of this connecting to off-premises things. Get, get more and more ready for how do I talk to secure, transmit data to off-premises systems. Shifting budgets. This one's been fun the last couple of days as people argue with me on this one because they're scared of it. <coughs> the Gartner estimated that 90% of technology spend by 2020 will be outside of the IT department. That's a little frightening. Arguably, it's, they say it's about 65% today is in IT. The rest is being spent by other business units. They also predicted by 2017, that the chief marketing officer will have more of a budget for technology than the CIO. Again, maybe that freaks you out. It should kind of freak us out. That money is leaving central IT. Central IT does not have the ownership of technology anymore. Why? Eh, cloud computing. I can buy an ERP system with a credit card. That is awesome. That is scary. The fact that nobody needs to ask anybody in this room's permission to spin up a CRM system, integrate with a directory system. Anything you do in your data center, I can do in the cloud. That's amazing, but that's also really gonna change the face of what we do as an IT team. So technology being done outside IT, I would think we're seeing more and more of that where people buy their own devices and hardware. People are spending money on consultants themselves or buying software as a service systems. That's the new normal. We're not gonna go back to central IT. You're gonna see more and more of this going the other way because you're empowering people now with cloud-based systems. And why is that? It's because of time to market. I don't think IT typically has a reputation for shipping things fast, great, and on time. It's, and it's because it's hard, because other things for good reasons, but people are looking at spending the money themselves in marketing and HR and legal and finance because they need things faster. They need that mobile app in six weeks. It, it doesn't matter if they choose six weeks to get a, a server to work on. They need it faster. So they're doing that with third parties or they're going straight to developers. There's a great ebook from the analyst firms, Redmonk, that says developers are the new kingmakers. The developers are running the show for a lot of companies because they are the real trusted technology advisor, not the system administrator. Sorry, Tor, administrators are, are struggling. Because you know they have some of the governance and process, which is great, but when the developer gets asked, hey, I need this built in two weeks, and they know it takes eight weeks to get a server, I'm just gonna spin that up on Azure and give it to them, right? Now you're gonna have a mess on your hands a couple years from now when your systems are everywhere and there's 48 passwords to manage a user. 
But for right now, people are trying to solve problems, and they're doing that outside of IT. So what does that mean for all of us? I propose that that means it's going to be harder and harder for you to justify upgrade projects. As when we already know middleware is not sexy, right? It's hard to sell people of why BizTalk is awesome and things like that because it doesn't have a UI on it for business people to look at. But more and more, when you're going and asking for a million dollars for upgrading your middleware, that's not going to be easier as the CIO's budget keeps shrinking. So it's just going to be a fact of life that you have to think about which becomes with cloud-based systems or just how do I maybe update certain things. It's just going to be harder and harder to get that funding. Thinking of new cloud-based ways of integrating or other ways that can help you be more agile when you're having shrinking dollars and not going to have the money to spend to upgrade versions every year and things like that. And that's where the integration platform is a service space when you look at some of these cloud-based tools. This is where BizTalk Services, SnapLogic, MuleSoft, Informatica On Demand, all these sort of cloud-based integration tools that can actually dip into your on-premises thanks to agents that can run on machines and things like that. So I can run a cloud-based integration tool that talks between different systems that I never upgrade. Right? I will never have an upgrade project if I'm using one of these cloud-based tools. They're updated in place. It's backwards compatible. I don't spend that money. That's really attractive. So you're going to see more and more of that versus investing more and more in commercial software in your data center. Open source. Open source isn't as scary as it was 15 years ago. Microsoft got made fun of a few weeks ago because their old We Hate Linux page was still on the internet and everyone was mocking them for it. Because even Microsoft makes it really easy to spin up Linux on Azure. All the SDKs are open source. The .NET framework is open source now, even though you can't contribute back. So there's more of a movement and acceptance of open source. 56% of companies say they're actually going to contribute to open source in some way this year. That's really different from where we were 10 years ago. And you're going to see more and more of that. That's, this is where innovation is happening in a lot of places. We have to be ready for it. So it's the mainstream usage it's that most companies in some way, shape, or form are using open source technology now. This is not the scary boogeyman it was 15 years ago about security and availability and stability. It's, this is where some of the best innovations are happening. You're really seeing some great communities popping up in this space where new products and technologies are getting crowds of people just for forming things on their own, not with some parent vendor company trying to force it. You're seeing a really good groundswell of activity, something that's fun for us to tap into too and learn new technologies, go attend one of their meetups. Great source of innovation though. All the major NoSQL databases are open source. Some great load balancing technologies, some great gateway products, some great OS advances are happening in open source right now. So it's something to be aware of. Not, don't cut off half of the market by only focusing on Windows. So what's the integration implications? Well, you're going to have new data sources. You're going to be talking to NoSQL databases. You're going to be talking to different endpoints running from open source platforms. On the plus side, more tools available. Right? It's great when I go to need a tool and I can go download it from GitHub or CodePlex or other tools and run it. That's really exciting as a developer, as an admin. I have more access to more things without commercial terms. That's great. There's a faster rate of change, though. We're, uh, my company and others are working with CoreOS. It's a distribution of Linux. They update that monthly. How many people are still running Windows Server 2003? Don't be ashamed. That's right. Wave it high. You're running an 11-year-old operating system, and I'm telling you new OSs are going to get updated monthly on a significant basis. That should absolutely horrify you. But that's, again, some of the rate of change of these things. If these things are changing much faster, it's going to be that much more exciting and painful for us, but that's the reality of this. So my controversial suggestion is you need to learn some Linux. Not saying you need to be an expert, but it's something where you really may be not accessing a lot of great innovation because you're not familiar at all with the environment. So take Perl <coughs> site courses, do other stuff, just get maybe functional in that environment. So you can stand up a certain environment and even test it out with your BizTalk process or something else. Get a little more comfortable so you can have more influence in your organization. So leading on that, container-based deployment is arguably the hottest thing in technology right now. Docker has been downloaded and run 13 million times in the last 12 months. It is the fastest growing open source project in history. Why is that? Because it's awesome and because it does something that you couldn't do well with virtual machines before. It's OS level virtualization. It's taking, in this case, just Linux machines, but carving up an individual machine by isolating the processes. So imagine each process is in a container that has 
CPU constraints, memory constraints. It can only access a portion of the file system. It has its own network address. So it almost acts like a little mini VM all within another physical or virtual machine. So it's a really cool way to get these sort of things really quickly. I spin up a Docker container in milliseconds. You just get one, here's, the, here's what runs in there, it's super fast. I can build full cluster scenarios on a single machine, tear it down, spin it up. We're using it for some of our continuous integration testing in our cloud product. More and more companies are even shipping their products in containers because they're very portable and easy to use. It's still maturing. You're seeing this updated all the time. But this is a very, very fascinating technology that arguably is gonna change what it looks like to host an application over the next five or 10 years. So what's it mean to all of us doing application integration? It's a different way of thinking. Let's say that this comes to Windows in the next couple of years, as there is work to, to do that. Imagine having a container for the single sign-on process. Your BizTalk host, a couple of databases, some web servers and a load balancer, all that you can spin up in seconds, test it out, try things out, do a test, and shut it back down. Very different way of thinking about how do I isolate and break apart my components, even in a Windows world. Right now though, completely open source centric. Every template you see, every application, it's all running in Linux, bless you, and it's doing that in that sort of environment. So again, if you're not playing around a little bit with open source, you're missing something interesting. This is very microservices friendly to tie to the other trend, is those are coming together where I can put each service in a container, and I can manage and move them around and have different life cycles. It's very conducive to this sort of decomposition trend we're seeing. DevOps keep moving through things that you hear about and say, good Lord, why is everyone talking about this? 61% of companies say they're either doing it or planning it. Again, whether they know what it is or not, they're definitely doing something. So what is it? It is lean for IT. If you're familiar with lean in the manufacturing space, it's about a focus on flow and streamlining flow, removing bottlenecks, eliminating waste. It's really trying to break down silos and say that delivering applications and services is a life cycle and it's one flow. I don't care if you've got separate QA teams, integration teams, change management, operations. You're all part of a single pipeline and your job is to ship things reliably, maintain them reliably, and keep them running. It's not the integration team's job to build integration. It's to deliver the systems and services that they're part of, right? Everyone's got a shared responsibility there. And so that's where the first part of DevOps is typically culture. Is there a culture of empowerment can, you know, in our case, our developers push our cloud product to our 12 data centers without telling operations. I think they do it just for fun to do that, but they don't have to, right? We've built the automation in place, we've built the process where they deploy, and it's automated, but you have a different level of empowerment where there's not the gates around everything. Automation is key. We don't have people hand keying and X copying files. We've got automation in place to pull from GitHub, build packages, deploy it to data centers, and start things up. That's the way that has to work in a good, successful way is to have the automation there. You can't improve what you can't measure. So it's all about measuring information, what's going on in the system, how do I get feedback on what's running and feed that back into the process. And then sharing, actual knowledge sharing, not having silos within your organization, but actually sharing information among teams, not trying to be the lone expert. So what does that mean for all of us when we talk about <laughs> DevOps for integration people? It means everything needs to be scriptable. If you are building your BizTalk environment by hand, I'll say you're doing it wrong, only to be controversial. Maybe if you're doing it great. But you shouldn't be doing it by hand. Everything you do, from deployments to shipping code to updating things, should be scripted and automated. Otherwise, you're gonna become a bottleneck in the pipeline. It doesn't matter how much faster the developers code, if deployment's a pain in the neck, you can only go as fast as your bottleneck. So you've gotta look at where are those points where I have things that are going slower, can I speed that up through automation? More collaboration, fewer silos. I don't know how many of you actually have dedicated integration teams, but odds are they are not as integrated into the developer team and operations team as they should be. And so you end up with silos again where you have different success metrics, you've got different work patterns, you have different tools you use, you're handing off bugs between three different systems. Stop doing that, right? It should be one flow. How do I make sure the integration team is integrated with the development team and operations team, so things are going faster. So the recap of all of them is that this is the trend, right? You are gonna have more data, whether you like it or not. You're gonna need more capacity, and probably elastic capacity. It has to be able to go up and down because you're gonna get bursts and then you're gonna have nothing. 
And do you buy a million licenses or you just buy a few and scale things up and down? You're gonna have more endpoints. There's things, there's mobile devices, there's wearables, there's more things generating data and they're gonna need data from our integration systems, but we have to be ready for that. And there's gonna be a lot more volatil volatility, right? I have to know that systems are updating all the time. I have to know partners are coming and going. Are my systems built to last or are they built to change? The old model was build them to last, build them so they never fail. The current model of thinking is always you build it, expect change, and you build to recover from failure fast because it's impossible to build to prevent failure. You just make sure you can recover fast. But you need less chattiness, right? Because I'm doing so many more things. I want less chattiness. I want more discrete operations. If I have all this latency and things <laughs> like that, I can't be having long, chatty conversations that are making the user experience terrible. I need less friction. That's where things like DevOps are huge, that if somebody comes to you and says, I need this shipped in three or four weeks, you're not probably doing that as an organization if each team has really strict working patterns, they don't talk to each other. And so the only way IT remains relevant is by shipping things faster and more automated and being a more trusted advisor to the other business units, not just a you know, party of no who doesn't do anything. But arguably less complexity. The goal is if I'm gonna to try to change a lot and be able to accept change, I can't have all this customization, I can't have all this brittle code I have to have things built in a microservices way or ways where I have decomposed dependencies so it's easier to be able to do this sort of thing. So how to prepare, I've probably stressed you out a little bit. You know, there's 12 trends, there's all this stuff going on. There's, I don't know, maybe you haven't heard of 11 of them. Maybe you've heard of all of them, but there's a lot of things coming and each one of these is at a different state of maturation, right? Some of them like mobility are here. Cloud computing is here, we're all seeing that. Oh sure, things like wearables, internet of things, even budgets changing, you're gonna see that over the next three to five years. But this is all coming in one way or another. And so hopefully we've seen how it impacts some of what we're doing, but that's kind of scary if you're already barely keeping up. So I'll give you three quickly, three E's for suggestions for how do you keep get ready for this. First, engage. If you're not on Twitter, shame on you. Get on Twitter, follow the fantastic BizTalk crew guys, maybe myself. But the point is engage, right? Get to find out things. I got my job because I was following people on Twitter and writing articles and doing things and I met the person who's now my boss who then convinced me to work for him. It just increases your network. It helps you find out some cool information that you might not be able to follow on every blog in the world. And so it's really just a fantastic medium for actually connecting with other smart people in your domain and in other domains. So get on that. Even if you lurk and don't tweet anything and you're the egg icon, it's fine, just get on there and start doing things. You're here, which means first of all, you're already in the top 5% of technology people who actually care to advance what they're working on. So congratulations to you because a lot of people don't do that, which is amazing. Like, I love these things, right? We come, we, we learn about technology, we talk during breaks, you get new ideas in your mind. This is what it's about sometimes. It's not just clicking through an article online in between meetings, it's actually dedicating the time to come to something like this, that's great. Same with conferences. If anyone here admits that when they watch a web conference that is the only thing they're doing, I'm gonna call you a liar because there's no way you're checking email, you're working, you're doing other stuff. You're doing that at conferences as well probably, but even more so when you're at your desk trying to watch a session from tech ed that you didn't go to. So go to conferences, right? It's, I know it's not as popular anymore to do the travel and things like that, but I think we all know when you saturate your brain for a couple of days on new technology or new ideas, that's awesome, right? That's, it's fun, exciting. Don't give that stuff up. And then harass your coworkers more, right? You should be doing brown bags between teams. Do you know what your DBAs are working on or what technologies they're exploring? Those poor operations guys get abused all the time. Poor tour. I mean, it's a, tough, it's a tough gig. They should be hanging out with your developers and explaining good practices for automation. Developers should be explaining what technologies they're working on. Your coworkers are some of the best sources of information about what's interesting and what works better. You're not gonna ever do DevOps, you're never gonna do an a streamlined pipeline if you're not actually taking out strangers for lunch and building some camaraderie and teamwork. So that's engage. Once you've engaged and feel like you know what you're doing, I'll, I'll throw an educate out there. New products. All this BizTalk stuff coming out, BizTalk services, using the new service bus components. Bang around on these. Some of these are free to try out. It's never been easier to try technology ever. You, go, you all can go get a Salesforce account right now for free for life. You can do the same thing with other products. 
try these things out. Dig in a little bit. Take an afternoon if you get a chance and tell your boss you're sick. And go bang on technology. Deploy an application. That's fun stuff. There's never been a better time to be doing cool technology stuff. It's never been a more fun time to be doing it. And a lot of this stuff is free. But there's also new protocols and new things to learn. MQTT, AMQP. There's all these new things that are going to impact Internet of Things and REST-based services. You're going to want to get familiar with those as well. New architectural ideas. Building these highly available, cluster-aware, distributed applications, that's going to be what the future looks like. Get familiar with that. Hadoop and NoSQL and all these sort of other concepts are probably going to play a part in your integration architecture. And then use training. Clearly, you should watch all of my Pluralsight courses, but anyone else's as well. Take training, right? It's fun. It's, again, a chance to dedicate some attention to a to technology topic. Make sure you're keeping yourself up to date. Stay fresh. There's a, it's a fun time for this. So you've engaged, you've educated. Finally, you have to engineer for it. You've got to get ready for this. Stop deploying big, fat, monolithic applications. Right? You can't have a BizTalk application DLL that's 50 megabytes or 50 gigs or whatever. Decompose your apps. Make different components that can update independently. The future is not monolithic applications. It's things that you can change on different independent life cycles. And you want to start teasing apart your really complex processes so you can adopt to this change. Maybe when you do that, you could swap out the service bus for something else you have on premises with changing nothing else. That might be really hard with some monolithic systems today. But when you do a new future of microservices and things, I could strategically swap out components for new technologies without gutting my entire system. Look at those edge technologies, things that can pre-filter content, the event hubs that have come in for Azure, Stream Insight and other stream processing tools. Ways to pre-filter content are going to be key. Complementary services, it's not just a BizTalk and SSIS world. Look at Workflow, look at App Fabric, look at Service Boss, look at these tools. All of those together are going to form your integration backbone, not one technology. Got to look at automation. Look at anything you're doing more than twice manually, shame on you. Automate it, right? We all wear shirts at our company that say run by robots. We're trying to build robots that run the cloud, not people who have to manually do stuff. Obviously, we all like our jobs. We don't want to automate ourselves out of a job. But what you really find is that the people who are doing the automation become really valuable because they understand what it takes to do it. It's a different task. It's not, I'm going to Windows update 50 machines. I'm going to script that so I can also keep doing other stuff. So it's not one or. You're not replacing yourself. You're making yourself more valuable. With that, you know, this is a crazy space. There's so much fun stuff happening. But there is change coming. This is not going to be. This presentation will not look the same five years from now. We're going to be doing different things, embrace some of these new technologies, try some things out, continue to explore new versions of BizTalk, BizTalk services, cloud-based technologies. This is going to be the new normal, and all of us have a great chance of being that trusted advisor to the companies we work for. So thank you.